Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk here about osteomyelitis and joint infections. So this is fairly straightforward. As we're going to see here, however, which may be a relief to you, um, some of the antibiotic regimens that we use for these uh, disorders, these diseases, these infections, um, are kind of up in the air. So that kind of takes a little pressure off of you on the exam. However, I still want to go over the principles of how we treat uh, each of these because uh, you may be tested on some basic concepts. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated and certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel. Hit the little box on the bottom right and you'll get notifications as I put more and more videos up. I try to do three or four every week at least. Okay, so we're gonna start out with osteomyelitis, uh, by far uh, the most high yield, um, a close second being septic arthritis, which is not a, boi a bone infection, rather it's a joint infection. We'll talk about Lyme's disease, and then we'll have a special feature of gas gangrene, which isn't particularly bo bone or joint, but it falls under this category as it pertains to soft tissue more generally. Osteomyelitis is an infection inflammation of any part of the bone structure. So uh, there tends to be a preponderance in the lower extremities. Why is that? Because our circulation to the lower extremities is not quite as good. Um, that's one big reason, as we're going to see uh, diabetics have an increased risk for osteomyelitis. But there is a preponderance in the lower extremities. Um, even in children, um, and also uh, we'll see that there's a preponderance in the vertebral bodies. The offending agents, Staph aureus is the most common cause in all age groups. However, Neisseria gonorrhea is a close second in young adults. Uh, most or many cases of osteomyelitis are polymicrobial. Risk factors include IV drug use, diabetes, prostheses, and sickle cell disease. Location in adults, number one location is the vertebral disc. Um, and because of the way the arteries are situated in the vertebral column, um, when you get osteomyelitis in one bone, it's generally going to affect one of the neighboring vertebrae as well. In children, the number one location is long bones where they can be confused with a tumor. Remember that many of the, uh, the bone tumors in children occur in the long bones. There are three different mechanisms, acute hematogenous, which is the most common. What happens is you get a septicemia and it seeds the bone. Post-traumatic or device related, pretty straightforward. You're putting something in the joint uh, that shouldn't be there. Um, naturally, it can get an infection. And then secondary due to vascular insufficiency, this is also very common, particularly among diabetics. Okay, um, so with the acute homogenous, this is going to predominate in pediatric cases, the tibia or femur, uh, and then in adults, the hematogenous route will be particularly associated with the vertebral bodies. So think tibia and femur in kids, vertebral bodies in adults. Uh, Post-traumatic or device-related can spread from septic arthritis, which we're going to talk about. Uh, and then with vascular insufficiency, this is almost always in older patients, and diabetes is a huge risk factor for this. So remember that there's not just one mechanism for osteomyelitis, there's actually three. Now the symptoms of osteomyelitis are very similar to cellulitis, um, at least in gross appearance. So you'll have some localized swelling and pain and redness over the affected area, Often you'll have a sinus tract which drains purulent material. And then because this, these patients have a significant infection, they can have constitutional symptoms as well. And that's just simply due to the inflammatory nature. Physical exam, unsurprisingly, you'll have a decreased range of motion at the affected site. You can have some point tenderness and surrounding inflammation and then that draining sinus tract. If you have osteomyelitis of the vertebrae, uh, that can actually go on to impinge upon the spinal cord, which then naturally is going to result in compressive symptoms like radicular pain and weakness and sensory loss. Now, the best initial diagnostic step when you suspect osteomyelitis is to get an x-ray. Okay, an x-ray is cheap. It's low dose of radiation. And if the osteomyelitis has gone on long enough, you may be able to detect it on x-ray and you can forego the CT. 
or the MRI. However, if you have a negative x-ray, that does not rule out osteomyelitis, at which point you're gonna proceed to the MRI. Um, MRI is the best next step after getting an x-ray. Uh, however, if a patient can't tolerate an MRI, if let's say they've got prosthetic parts or something, then you're gonna get a CT. Uh, the most accurate test is a bone biopsy with culture. This needs to be performed to make a definitive diagnosis. Now, in many, many infections, we don't get biopsies. We just treat presumptively and empirically. However, in this case, in osteomyelitis, you must get a bone biopsy with culture. You also want to get blood cultures as well, because remember that many of these patients do have a bacteremia. Um, and then as far as treatment, we base it on the suspected organisms and then switch when the sensitivities come back. That's a pretty classic way of going about things um, in infectious disease. So if you suspect methicillin-sensitive staph aureus, nafcillin or oxicillin are fine. If you suspect MRSA, let's say that it's prevalent in the area or the patient is in a nursing home or some kind of care facility and they develop osteomyelitis, you should really think MRSA. And then if you suspect a gram-negative, namely Neisseria gonorrhea, you should go with ceftriaxone. However, these recommendations are constantly changing and these are not the only drugs that you can use in each of these populations. This is what you'll find on an MRI. So you can see right here where the arrow is pointing is showing the, uh, the extent of the infection. Now this is uh, uh, the sinus tract here that I was telling you about. Notice the localized inflammation and swelling. You can also see it here on the foot. I guarantee you this guy here is a diabetic. Um, you can also see he is status post uh, left great toe amputation and right, I guess. So this is how it typically happens. My dad has this condition. He's already, now he's had five toes on his right foot amputated. It's pretty sad. I've tried to fix his habits. He won't do it. He's stubborn as a mule. Do not culture the sinus tract. That's such a common wrong answer choice. You've got to culture the bone. The sinus tract is not going to tell you much. Septic arthritis is inflammation through infection of the synovial fluid, resulting in pain of the affected joint. Again, the most common cause here is staph aureus, but it kind of splits here. Streptococci can happen. Neisseria gonorrhea is the number two cause in young adults. And then gram-negative bacilli. Risk factors are everything you'd expect. Um, anything that can cause compromise of the joint and anytime you have something in the joint that shouldn't be there. The best initial diagnostic step and the most accurate test is to do an arthrocentesis and look at the synovial fluid. So make sure you're doing a synovial fluid analysis uh, and that you're getting a culture as well. There are two categories, non-gonococcal, which is primarily going to be in older patients. However, non-gonococcal causes are the majority. And then gonococcal, which you need to think of in younger sexually active people, especially those who have polyarthritis, lots of small joints, maybe it's migrating a little bit, um, and especially if they're getting it in their hands where it tends to be. They may also develop a rash and they may have a recent history of a gonococcal infection. Usually we think of Neisseria gonorrhea, however, Neisseria meningitidis can also cause uh, a septic arthritis in rare cases. Uh, so this is basically everything I went over. Uh, the treatment for non-gonococcal septic arthritis, because we need to cover staph aureus, uh, and we don't know if it's MSSA or MRSA, we're going to give vancomycin and ceftriaxone. That'll cover everything, including MRSA. And so that's good to start out with and then adjust based on your culture. With gonococcal septic arthritis, we only need to give ceftriaxone if that is the known cause. So typically what you're going to do is you're going to start out with vancomycin and ceftriaxone. If it comes back that it was gonococcal, you can stop the vancomycin. Vancomycin is a tough drug. You need, usually you often need to have a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist following these patients because the peaks and the troughs, there's a narrow uh, therapeutic window. And so um, it's not a convenient drug to give. This is what you'll find. It is just localized redness and swelling of the joint. All right, Lyme disease is polysystemic and multiphasic. It's caused by the spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi, which is carried by the Ixodes tick. And it's prevalent in specific areas in the US. That's gonna be in the Northeast and around the Great Lakes area. In a vignette, look for a camper, hiker, or hunter who got a rash and then was never tested. So what they're telling you is that this patient had Lyme disease and was never treated. 
And because joint inflammation is a a more distal consequence of Lyme disease, um, this is not going to be a patient presenting with that target rash. That's early on. So you may not see that in physical exam. There are these three stages um, and you can stop this as long as you're treated, but this is the natural progression. Best initial test is serology. That's also going to be the most accurate. Uh, the treatment here depends on age and pregnancy status. So doxycycline is going to be provided to all patients with early uh, uh, Lyme disease uh, unless they are under the age of eight or they're pregnant and breastfeeding. If that is the case for them, we can go with amoxicillin. Now, if they have CNS or cardiac involvement, or if they fail doxycycline or amoxicillin, we can use ceftriaxone and that will be given IV. So as far as USMLE is concerned, chronic Lyme disease is not real. I don't know. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of advocacy groups say it is. I trust patients, but on the USMLE, chronic is not real. This is the erythema migrans. You will probably not see this in conjunction with joint issues, but it is the early presentation. The tick bit right here, it caused this targetoid lesion. This is the uh, inflammation that you would see, the, the, the joint inflammation that you would see. Mostly what you have here is an effusion. It's not as red and angry as septic arthritis. This is an inflammatory arthritis. Okay, gas gangrene is what we'll finish with. This is an anaerobic infection of the muscle and soft tissue, usually due to a penetra penetrating trauma. The causative agent here is Clostridium perfringens, which makes a toxin called alpha toxin. And this results in necrosis of the muscle cells, swelling, sepsis, and, uh, and a variety of other manifestations. This is a surgical emergency. Um, the presentation is going to be a, a pretty nasty looking uh, erythema. Sometimes it can turn purplish or blue. Um, so look for that. Another thing that you'll see, which is not very sensitive, but is very highly specific for gas gangrene is crepitus. Uh, some people call it subcutaneous emphysema, I believe, but I just like crepitus. Uh, often it's uh, going to show hemorrhagic bullae, which have a distinct appearance. You'll want to be aware of that. And then they can have symptoms of shock, which obviously are going to include hemodynamic instability. If you're given the option, you want to gram stain the inf inf infected exudate, or just the exudate, I guess, and you'll look at it under the microscope. And what you'll see with clostridium is these gram positive, so purple rods that are lined up in boxcar formation. So they look like that, they look kind of like a train. Otherwise you can diagnose this clinically if it's a very obvious appearance and you need to because this is an emergency. So once you make the diagnosis, you're gonna be sending them off for emergent surgical debridement. That can also be cultured and you wanna provide empiric antibiotics. This is where antibiotics are actually very important and you're gonna be giving them penicillin or some kind of beta-lactam and clindamycin. Why do we need to do both? The penicillin drug will kill Clostridium perfringens and clindamycin, remember how clindamycin works. It inhibits the ribosome. Why is that important? It will shut down toxin production. So we're killing the bacteria and we're stopping future toxin production. That is why we give both. This is what it looks like. Um, so it doesn't, I mean, it looks bad. I know having been in medicine long enough, if I see this, this is bad, but you might look at it and think, oh, that's just a you know really bad bruise, but the patient will think this is the worst pain they've ever felt. You can see how these bullae form, and these are very clearly hemorrhagic bullae. And here's just a recap of everything we talked about.